So let's talk for a moment about how we got here. Why are we practicing in the way that we are in this find it, fix it, predominantly reactive way? Well, it actually is rooted back in science and the history of medicine. If you think about prior to 1900 or so, disease was believed to come from the imbalance of four different humors. Then science made some advances, and among them was germ theory. So we realized, we discovered, that there are actually microbes, for example, that cause some infection and disease. This advancement of, of biology and microbiology and pathology, particularly rooted in germ theory, made us understand that a lot of disease comes from a single factor, a bacteria, that causes a disease. And this created the paradigm that, well, then our job is to find the factor and fix it. So we get an antibiotic and we fix the disease. That simple causative agent creating the disease has really created the paradigm that we've been talking about, this predominantly find it, fix it paradigm. So now we advance 100 years. And what has our science advanced to? Well, we know a lot more about complexity theory and systems biology there's proteomics and metabolomics and genomics, I call them the omics. There's a lot deeper understanding that health and disease is an almost all of the time a multifactorial issue. We are born with certain genetic risks, then we have environmental factors that decide and determine to a large degree whether we get sick or stay healthy. So we understand that across a progression of disease, there are a multitude of factors that affect health and disease. Now is the time for our medical model to shift to catch up with the science, just like back in the 1900s. So let's take a minute and look at this graph. I think it's very useful. I want to orient you. Across the horizontal axis, we have time. So if this is an individual, this is their time from birth, and then as a disease develops, across time. Along the vertical axis, we have cost. So the further up we go, the more costly, and the less likely we can reverse the disease. So what's typical? With our existing medical model, the find it, fix it approach, we usually wait till we get to about this inflection point on the curve to intervene. And as you can see, we're pretty far down the line, the cost is already pretty high, and the chance of reversibility is pretty low. The goal here is to move to the left on this curve to begin to intervene not only at the earliest clinical detection, but perhaps molecular detection, or even better, let's start at the beginning with someone's risk, understand their risk, and do what we can to reduce that risk. It's a very different approach that works across someone's lifetime and is a much more proactive approach. So really, where does this leave us? This leaves us with understanding that improving our current delivery system doing things better and more efficiently and more fast, more effective. And even if we show greater empathy, isn't enough. It's not going to change this underlying paradigm. We really need to expand our current ways of doing things to be more patient-centered, more proactive, more personalized. I'd like you to take a minute, if you would, and think about a time, either in your own life, in the life of a family member or friend or a patient, where this approach, this find it, fix it, reactive paradigm, fell short. It didn't give us the best outcomes. Maybe it actually did harm unintentionally. And just allow yourself to reflect on that. I'd like to take a minute and talk about something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is the suicides and weapon-related incidents amongst our veterans, and see what there is for us to understand and learn as it relates to this topic. I was meeting recently with Assistant Secretary Riojas, and they, in his office, had just reviewed all weapon-related incidents in veterans for many years. And interestingly, they found three things in common with every one of those incidents. There was either a history of the veteran having depression, which isn't particularly surprising, sleep disorders, or pain, chronic pain. And if you stop for a moment and think about those disorders, each one of them, depression, sleep disorders, and pain, are areas that we don't do a good find it, fix it approach with. We can't just tag it, prescribe, and it's done. In all of those areas, that model fails. So in many ways, the system is failing the veterans in that regard. 
I was talking to a facility director who had just reviewed two recent suicides in their facility. And he said, you know, we looked at this, every clinical reminder was done, all the performance measures were met. So what happened? It's not a failure of the people who care so much and are compassionate and wanting to do the right thing. It's a system problem. We checked the boxes, we did the clinical reminders, we met the performance measures, and we missed the suffering. We weren't designed to ask it or look for it. So in this future model of care, we see the whole person and where they are and what matters to them and are better equipped to address it. So what is the root cause of our failure of the system? You know, there's a lot of factors, but what's the fundamental root cause? The root cause of this whole healthcare crisis that we're in is that we've put the disease at the center of what we do, not the person, not the individual. And I think better than I could ever say it, one of our patients who is a veteran in the blind rehab program in Tucson said it in a way that captures it better than I can. So take a listen. When you start losing your identity, then you lose, you lose your will to survive. And now that I've got my identity back, then I have a will to survive. I have a will to keep going on. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what motivates me. That's what drives me. You know, I have to have a purpose. And once I develop that purpose, then I can keep going on. As Ed said beautifully and powerfully, until we are reconnected with what matters to us, our purpose, the motivation to do difficult life changes and sustain that across time is not going to happen. So let's talk about why we should put all of this energy and effort into changing the healthcare system, because that's a big thing to undertake. I want to make a case for you. If you look at this slide, which is a graph of a couple of things, let me take a minute and orient you to this graph. What we have here is the bar graphs, the light purple bar graph is the average life expectancy in each of these countries listed on the bottom. And the dark line purple graph is the per capita spending in healthcare in those countries. So the United States is actually very easy to find because we peak, right? Our spending is far more than any of these other countries. But what is really fascinating to realize is that when it comes to average life expectancy, we're all the way down here next to Cuba. And actually, the first time I saw this, I thought it was a cartoon. I didn't think it was real data. It's real data. So what is this telling us? For me, it's telling me that doing more of the same, just putting more money in, doing our current system faster, better, is not going to work. That's not the solution. And you could argue that average life expectancy isn't the only outcome that matters, but most people would agree that it is an important one, because if you're not alive, the state of your health isn't really important. So this is a really important statement. Doing more of the same will not fix the problem. So just let's think about the context of the United States right now and the healthcare crisis that we're in. Healthcare right now consumes 18% of our GNP, our gross national product, with unsatisfactory results. In some areas we do well, but in a lot of areas, in chronic conditions and in life expectancy, we're not doing as well as we would want to do. If our spending continues to rise at the current rate, which is 5% a year, by 2021, healthcare will consume 31% of our gross national product. That is unsustainable. All the economics, it, everybody is clear that that will crumble the U.S.'s ability to compete globally in this world in the market. We cannot sustain it. The good news about that is that, from my perspective, it creates an imperative to change. We can do a better job, and now we have to. We really don't have a choice. So let's just take a moment and look at how we're doing in healthcare and outcomes over the last 10 years in a couple of important areas, heart disease, ischemic heart disease. As you can see, we've had a 25% increase in ischemic heart disease in this country in the last 10 years. What about diabetes? Diabetes in the last 10 years, 32% increase. So the system is not working. What about stroke? 27% increase of stroke, incidence of stroke in this country in the last 10 years. Our current system isn't working. 
What about within the VA? Let's just look at obesity trends. And this data is from our National Center for Health Promotion Disease Prevention. What this slide will show you is the percentage of people who have a body mass index in the obesity range. And that's the, really all you need to know is that that is the darkest color on this maps of the United States. And what you can see is this trend across the last 10 years that every region of the country is getting worse in our obesity percentages. And the question might be, is that only our older population? Take a look at the OEF, OIF veterans. These are the trends of who is actually, by medical terms, obese in this dark purple. So we have a big issue, and doing more of the same is not going to fix the problem. So let's look for a moment at this slide. What this is, Dr. Jane and his team put together a model to project the future need of dialysis, so for patients with end-stage renal disease, their need for dialysis in the years to come. It's based, you can tell, the beginning part of the graph is based on our actual real data up through fiscal year 11. What they did was then model the continuing trend of this need for dialysis. And you'll look at where we go. It's to the sky. By fiscal year 31, the need for dialysis is so great. The key to this graph is that little tiny red bar, that part of the graph, that's our capacity to provide dialysis to our patients. So you can see that this is not headed in the right direction. Major, major issues. So I don't think there's any argument that doing more of the same, even if we do it better and find it better and find it faster and fix it better, we will not change these trends. That's not the problem. It's not going to work for the VA and it's not going to work for the country. The good news is we're not the only ones seeing the problem this way. A lot of people around the world are seeing the same issues and calling for the same kind of change. The Institutes of Medicine back in February of 2009 held a national summit called Integrated Medicine and the Health of the Public and in their executive summary they said the following. The disease-driven approach to care has resulted in spiraling costs as well as a fragmented health system that is reactive and episodic as well as inefficient and impersonal. So they're seeing the issue is the same. So what is up with this? The current system isn't working, why? Certainly not because of the people in the system. I don't know anyone that's gone into medicine or healthcare, and particularly the VA is filled with amazingly skilled and compassionate people. It's not about the people, it's about the system. Think about chronic conditions. Chronic conditions consume more than 75% of our healthcare dollars. And they're largely impacted by what we do every day and our health behaviors and our choices. And yet our system is best at finding and fixing problems. We have no core competency in working and partnering with people to optimize their health and well-being. Let me say that again because it's a really critical piece. The system is not designed to partner with people and help them optimize their health and well-being. Whether they're sick or well or dying, we don't do that well. It's not what we're designed to do. And that's the transition that we're talking about. Now we have a professional and an economic imperative to change. Let's take heart disease as an example. It's a great example. First of all, as you probably know, heart disease is the number one killer of men and women, both in this country and around the world. So how do we deal with heart disease? And again, a great illustration of what our system is good at doing, finding and fixing the problems. In 2006, we did 1.3 million angioplasties. And if you're not familiar with that term, the angioplasties are cardiac catheterizations where we then either put in a, a balloon to, to open coronary arteries that may be clogged or put a stent, a little tube in, to open those clogged arteries. That's the process. So 1.3 million angioplasties that year, about 50,000 each, about $60 billion with a B spent in 2006 on those procedures. We did about half a million, 500,000 open heart bypass surgeries, about 100,000 each, 44 billion. So what kind of outcomes do we get with these invasive expensive procedures? Well, here's the thing. Angioplasties and stents do not 
prolong life or prevent heart attacks when done in stable patients. Now what does that mean? It means if you're having a heart attack, if you're in the middle of a heart attack and you get to an emergency room and they, in an emergency setting, cardiac cath you, that procedure probably saved your life. But 95% of the time when we do those procedures, they are in stable patients. And in those patients, 95% of the patients that we do them in, they have never been shown to prolong life or prevent heart attacks. Now, the procedures may reduce other symptoms and have other benefits, but not the primary benefit we want. What about open heart surgery? Bypass surgery has been shown to prolong life in less than 3% of the people who have that procedure. Three out of 100 people, it prolongs life. Now take that picture and juxtapose those statistics with this one. Changing lifestyle could prevent at least 90% of all heart disease. Prevent at least 90% of all heart disease, the number one killer of men and women in this country and worldwide. So what's the situation? What's the deal? The deal is we have a system of medicine that knows how to do the top stuff and doesn't know how to affect the bottom part. So we have a big challenge and a big opportunity. So the other interesting thing, back to Dr. Jane's uh, model with renal dialysis. As you remember, the curve is steep and headed in the wrong direction. So they modeled many different ways to see what could they do that would meet the need for the veterans around this. They even modeled things like, well, let's build more dialysis units. Nothing, not even building more dialysis units, bent this curve. The only thing that bent the curve in this way was actually intervening earlier to help prevent the need for dialysis. So working with patients with hypertension and diabetes and effectively reducing the need for dialysis, the only thing that made a difference in this projection. So what is the answer? It's interesting that the VA is not the only institution calling for this kind of change. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Institution of Medicine, Back when they did their Crossing the Quality Chasm that was published 10 years ago, 2001, they defined our current approach as we've discussed it, care based on visits, and have described the new approach where we need to be is care that is based on continuous healing relationships. I love all those words, continuous, not reactive, healing relationships, to shift from the situation where professional autonomy drives a lot of variability to moving to care that is customized according to the patient's needs and values. And finally, to shift from where the professionals control the care to where the patient is the source of control. So these are not ideas that are just being birthed in the VA. This is where we need to head, and we're aware of that. And if you take a look at the VA's mission, we say it. What is our mission? to honor America's veterans by providing exceptional health care that does what? Treats their diseased body part? No. That improves their health and well-being. That improves their health and well-being. Now, of course, that includes treating their diseased body parts, but it's bigger than that. That's a big promise. And what is health? We have a definition that's fabulous from the World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So that's where we're headed. So the National Leadership Council of the Veterans Health Administration, the leadership of our organization, came together at their strategic planning retreat recently and said, how can we help focus our priorities around this transformation? So VA leadership has become aware that we have to prioritize the strategic goals. We have a lot of priorities in our organization but we're not gonna to get to a transformed future state if we don't get very, very clear about what the highest priorities are. So under the leadership of Dr. Petzl, Dr. Jesse, Dr. Agarwal, and Mr. Schoenhardt, the National Leadership Council has created the three strategic priorities for the next five years. And actually it's about one, the first one. The first strategic priority is to provide veterans personalized, proactive, patient-driven health care. The second and third goal are actually in support of that first goal. 
The second goal is to incentivize measurable improvements in health outcomes. What does that mean? That means we need to measure and reward the kinds of approaches that result in proactive patient-driven health care. We all know that some of the times we're measuring things that actually disincentivize that approach to health care has to change. And the third goal is to align our resources in support of this approach to health care. What does it mean to have personalized, proactive, patient-driven health care? It was defined by the National Leadership Council in this way. The VA healthcare partners with each veteran to create a personalized, proactive strategy to optimize health and well-being, and when needed, provide state-of-the-art disease management. The National Leadership Council went on to define those terms. What do we mean by personalized? Well, here are the definitions. Personalized, a dynamic adaption or customization of recommendation, education, prevention, treatment that is specifically relevant to that individual user based on their history, clinical presentation, lifestyle, behavior, and preferences. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not that everyone should be on this lipid-lowering agent because I need to get to this standard of a lipid level. It's really working with a personalized approach. Proactive, what does that mean? It means acting in advance of a future situation rather than just reacting. Taking initiative to make things happen rather than just adjusting to the situation. How do we help veterans have a proactive approach to their health and their life? And patient-driven, I love this, because this is way more than just taking someone's values or preferences into account. Patient-driven is an engagement between a patient and a healthcare system where the patient is the source of control, such that their health care is based in their needs, their values, and how they want to live. That's what it's about. There's a couple of key things about going from where we are, our current or as-is condition, to where we're going to be, our will-be condition. In some ways, I think, defining the future medical model is the easy part. It gets trickier when it comes down to how do we actually incentivize the right behavior. A lot of you have said to me and given me great examples of how we inadvertently, unintentionally, disincentivize this kind of health care because we measure and we have to perform in a certain way to meet a measurement or a clinical reminder that's very clear about what we should be doing. And it takes away the opportunity to really practice medicine in the way we've been describing. It has to change. We can no longer measure value and reward episodic application of diagnostics or pharmaceuticals as if that's success. They're just transactions. What we do need to do is develop measures of lifelong health and well-being. That has to be what we value and reward. That's success. We need to expand and constantly innovate our repertoire of prevention strategies, interventions, both conventional and complementary approaches to healthcare. And we have to always remember the veteran is the captain of the team, and we're some of the invited guests.